is and they're taking OSR concurrently with that. I forgot the chemical name of the, the drug. I don't know if I could pronounce it, but... One for who? Well, We have we, we sold it for two years. We didn't have one what they call significant adverse effect reported to us. We had 13, but there were things like, my son's peeing more, is that okay? And the box wasn't totally full. There was not one serious or significant adverse effect, and none were sent to the FDA. The uh, thing that came out of the two years of selling that is that children and people who uh, are sensitive to sulfur-containing compounds, those there are some of them that can't even take glutathione, anytime dietary sulfur containing compound they would get sick and OSR was not any different that it would just made them more stemmy and so I went to the literature and started digging and I found the two articles about children that died uh, shortly after birth that didn't have enough molybdenum and they died of sulfite toxicity which led to demyelinization of their central nervous system and uh, then I put that together looked up it was a molybdenum shortage in these people we went to uh, Rosemary Waring's research in biochemistry on autistic children, and she said they were low in sulfate, and they were. And the reason that what they overlooked that, and they were high in sulfite, because sulfite in the, in the process of removing excess sulfur-containing compounds from your body, you take sulfur, SH groups, you turn it to sulfite. Sulfite is very neurotoxic. And you get that sulfite converted rapidly to sulfate, which is not toxic. If you inhibit that step, the, sul the uh, sulfite levels build up. And I would tell you, autistic children have 53 times higher level of sulfite than non-autistic children. And when we were f found this, we put into the thing, when people bought OSR, we put it on a and I wrote a thing about molybdenum and molybdoterin. When people started using, supplementing with molybdenum, they uh, had no problem with taking sulfur-containing compounds. And the interesting thing about some of you here that drink a lot, if you look at a bottle of wine, it'll say contains sulfite because there are some people in they cannot take sulfite. If you take molybdenum supplementation, you probably will be able to drink that wine without any problem. So that's the only interaction that I can think of, and that's for all sulfur compounds, not just those are. But it, it didn't have a bad reaction with any drug or anything. Thank you. Oh, Let me just add and see if you agree with this, but um, molybdenum should usually be adequate in the diet, but as I understand, mercury depletes molybdenum, so it sort of creates its own problem, and the supplementation level that Dr. John Wilson, I think, was using was one milligram per day for a couple of weeks before starting the OSR if he didn't he wasn't sure about the molybdenum status, and then that help, would help prevent the, the, the sulfite toxicity problem. What Leo says is exactly right. Uh, molybdenum in, in uh, being a cofactor for the enzyme sulfite oxidase is in the form of a molecule called lib molybdoterin, and I know all of you remember that structure from last year when I put it on the board for you. <laughs> but it, it, it's a chelator. It has two sulfur groups just like OSR. I'm just, I mean, just like the compound we had, or just like DMPS, and the, it sits in there, and the molybdenum is knocked off by mercury, and that's exactly right, Leo. Mercury toxicity makes you molybdenum deficient, and that's one other reason why I think mercury caused the autism epidemic. Um, Dr. Healy, is your um, OSR available? Million dollar question. Uh, no, unless you want to rob me. I mean, I, 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 if I gave it to you, I'd go to jail. I think the FDA does not want that out there, uh, and they they've classified it as a an unapproved drug. And we're we're in the process now of getting uh, the funding to get the pre IND and that's an in, introductory new drug and and to get it uh, through classified as a drug. But it'll take a while, a long while. There is nothing fast about getting anything approved through the government with regard to drugs. I have one more question because I'm just a dumb dentist. Um, 
I have patients that say that they're allergic to sulfur or allergic to iodine, and, and I know they can't be allergic to themselves. Could any of you answer how to address allergies to iodine or sulfur? If you just think about it, these people are allergic to cysteine. If they take cysteine in their diet, they will get sick if their bodies are loaded with cysteine. Same thing with glutathione. So when you take in a dietary sulfur, your body has to metabolize that. And part of the metabolic pathway after you get rid, after you use all the cysteine you need for protein synthesis, is you oxidize that cysteine, the sulfur group, to a sulfite, to a sulfate, and get rid of it. And it's the building up of the sulfite that makes them sick. That's the toxic aspect of sulfur toxicity, and that's what you need to address. So they're not, they're, they're, to say that it's, allergic is not the right word. They have an adverse effect because their bodies aren't good at metabolizing sulfur containing amino acids. And usually that's due to a lack of molybdenum, definitely due to a lack of sulfite oxidase activity. More questions? We've heard a lot about glutathione. What's the best thing you can do as a dentist just to keep your own glutathione levels up? What's the best thing you can do as a dentist just to keep your own glutathione levels up? Dietary, I mean. If, if you uh, remember the lecture, the, the primary uh, consumption of reduced glutathione, GSH, is to go to GSSG. And there's a thing called the Meyer cycle that takes uh, vitamin C, converting it to NADH and takes the GSSG back to two GSHs. So you can recover oxidized glutathione with high dose vitamin C. That's the number one thing. Anything that will elevate your NADH levels will do that. There are a lot of supplements that will do that, but vitamin C is probably the easiest to take. The second thing is in the synthesis, natural synthesis of glutathione, the rate limiting step in most humans is the lack of cysteine. Because cysteine is a sulfur containing amino acid, it gets oxidized on cooking. And if you have it, you eat a lot of preserved or uh, food that's been processed a long time, you don't get enough cysteine. So they've shown that with most Americans, inastyl cysteine is the best thing to give to increase their internal glutathione levels naturally. All right, thanks again, boy. Anybody else? I got a question while we're waiting. I'm sorry, John. Uh, thermography question. Are there any, uh, all the images that we saw today, the ones that we finally saw, um, showed uh, the lateral views of, of the head and the neck? Are there any smaller devices that dentists could use to uh, diagnose local problems, to your knowledge? Well, just a, a, a blown-up view, I guess, to identify what tooth is involved or what area of the jaw could be involved uh, with yeah. the inflammation. Uh, you can you can zoom in with the camera and well, same camera. Yeah. Oh, great. So, thank you, uh, Dr. John Wilson. Uh, Dr. Sukai, uh, I wanted to comment a bit about your your talk and in that you're involved in Superfund cleanup. And I, I've always sort of thought what the dentists in this group do is Superfund cleanup with every patient who comes in with a mouthful of mercury. Has the NIEHS ever actually looked at that from a standpoint of a Superfund cleanup, you know, getting the mercury out of somebody's mouth and... Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. <laughs> uh, two things. One is that um, the program that I run is not a cleanup program. It's a research program that's designed to develop tools and technologies to allow for EPA and others to uh, either assess toxicity or, excuse me, assess risk or the uncertainty of risk or and or to clean things up. Okay, so that, just to clarify that point. But um, I would suggest that you might, if you really want to know the answer to your question, um, you might want to contact folks within ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is at the CDC in Atlanta. And they also have uh, offices in each of the regions of EPA headquarters. And their job is to look at um, 
to assess toxicity of populations living in close proximity to sites. And it is at least possible that you might get an answer to your question by asking somebody there. I don't have the answer to it. That would be, an, good interesting, question. It would be an interesting question, and I would be really surprised if they had looked at it, because it seems to be the black hole in the whole world of toxicity that thinking dentists are somehow exonerated. And they can work in this toxic soup, and nobody else has to, everybody else has to be concerned about it, but dentists, it's okay. I'm not a dentist, so I'm sympathetic to my brethren here in this field. Uh, I have a thermology question as well. Um, I, I've done ther ther thermography in my practice for years and uh, have been using a uh, thermographer who does the interpretations, who uses the Marseille International Classification System, and I know there's a whole, a whole school of thermography out there that doesn't use it at all, and that doesn't even recommend doing thermal challenges when doing uh, breast uh, Im imagery. For those of you not familiar, thermal challenges where you have the woman immerse their hands in ice water for 30 seconds. It's quite painful, but it sort of it causes a, a sympathetic dis, uh, discharge and, and constricts all of the blood vessels that are up, you know, that are on the on the network. And of course, tumor cells are not, and so they, if if there's not a a, a, a sympathetic. Uh, if the if the hot spots don't cool off with the with the uh, cold challenge, it's a real symptom uh, that it, it's a real indication that it's off network. Anyway, could you comment about that whole uh, thermology challenge and the market? Say system? Your question is actually music to my ears because I'm getting the same thing from other sources. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me to dispense with a test of physiology if we're conducting a test of physiology. So cold challenge, if you remember, there are two types of thermography. One is called static and the other one is called dynamic. And this is where the cold challenge or any kind of challenge comes in and creates that into a dynamic form of testing. So initially, probably you do the same thing because we seem to adhere to the same standard. <clears throat> initially, we have baseline images. And then we challenge the person, whether it's with cold water or anything else. There are other ways of challenging people. Um, and, and collect a, another set of images comparing that to base to baseline. So what it gives us is an illustration of how this person's physiology responds with a challenge. So I actually, when I look at breast physiology, I don't even look at baseline anymore. I just look at the challenge or what we call uh, functional image. If the functional image is out of sorts or it's out of normal limits, then there is a problem. If there is a problem with the baseline and that problem seems to be self-corrected under challenge, there's not a problem there. So it's very important. I personally feel I'm going to call a spade a spade that they've gotten rid of cold challenge for marketing purposes because if it's done properly, it adds information. Now, some people will get results that are not consistent, and then they'll say, we don't get consistent results. Uh, women are complaining about submerging their hands into cold water. Actually, it's not that cold. If it's done properly, it's done for 60 seconds uh, with a temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not that cold. In the case where someone has extreme sensitivity or Raynaud's, there are other ways of keeping that challenge and not actually torturing them. Um, but for the most part, the information that we have with just 60 seconds of that extra test is very, very useful. It's not going to be useful in each and every case because each and every case is not high risk. It's going to be extremely useful uh, when we have a high risk individual. And in her case, she's moving exactly in the opposite direction. So if you, sorry, I'm taking a little longer than usual. Um, you basically, we're looking for basic constriction. You put your hands into cold water, you want your blood vessels to constrict, right? Okay. Now, if 
the area of interest that we're already suspicious about, if the rest of the breast is, is cooling down, if the opposite breast is cooling down, but that particular spot remains the same, or worse, actually becomes warmer, it tells us something. Maybe there is nitric oxide that's, that's involved. Maybe there are a few other physiological processes that interfere with normal cooling down. So everyone who is not doing cold challenge tests for whatever reason are basically doing thermography, but only having half the test and half of the information. With regards to the first half of the question, the Marseille uh, protocol, this uh, was done in 1982. There was a published study in Marseille, uh, Pasteur University, where the French have imaged 150,000 women. That's a large enough sample, and probably only in France they can get 150,000 women, and followed them around for five years. So it was um, done over five years. They've collected all these images, and then they had access to data saying, okay, this one got breast cancer, this one didn't. So they went back to see all these images and came up with a qualitative and quantitative analysis of the statistical probability uh, where, based on certain patterns within five years, this is the statistical probability of these women getting uh, breast cancer. Okay? Thank you. Question? This right here. This is for Dr. Reem, is it? Reem. Um, I noticed in your presentation that you didn't mention anything about ozone. Anything about ozone? About ozone therapy? Yes. Uh -huh. and, I mean, if you're not using ozone, why not? And what's your thinking on that? Um, that's a good question. Is Bob Harris here this weekend? He is here. Is Bob here? He's the expert probably on ozone therapy. It's just another modality, I think, that has very legitimate usage. Um, I guess I'm just kind of careful what I want to use. I, I, I would like to use it probably in the future. Uh, I just haven't implemented it in my practice at this time. Yeah, Bob Harris and Phil Mullica are uh, exhibiting on the other side. You want to maybe contact them, ask them your question. I've taken the course. It's great. I recommend it. Hi. This is a thermography question. I want to know, are there, can you use thermography to identify an osteonecrotic lesion? Like um, a cavitation within bone. Would, could I assume that if I saw like black there, would that, would that indicate cavitation? The short answer to your question is I don't know. I really don't know because I, don't, I haven't had enough experience and I'm hoping maybe to work with uh, someone in Mississauga, that's how it's pronounced, Mississauga, Ontario, uh, because she has a cavitat machine, I understand, and I just haven't had the experience to, to be able to tell you that question. I would assume probably we would be able to see a temperature difference, but I just can't tell you for sure. Of the thermography um, images that I have seen in the past and then followed up with a cavitat, there is co a very strong correlation. Actually, I have a question for Alexander, too. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. John Wilson and I were listening to your presentation, uh, and we were quite impressed with some of the images that, that we did see. And what we were thinking about maybe doing our own little bit of research, and he was going to do uh, some thermography of the face and the breast, and I was going to do a CT scan with my Galileos at the office, and then if we found a bad root canal on that side, extracted it, and see what kind of results we got as far as post-op and gather that information. Would you have some suggestions about the methodology to do that, how often to take the images, um, what kind of results you think we could expect to achieve if we had it set up in a certain way? Right. I, I guess it all depends on where this person is in terms of her disease. Right. Um, if it's early enough, I think that you'll have some incredible uh, results. Um, how best organize this? I mean, we can get together and, and set something up where we can see how to best organize this. But 
As a matter of fact, before I came here, I was hoping that I would get someone's interest to do a, a study like this because it's way overdue and um, it certainly is uh, needed. I see the connection. Dr. Simon see a connection. Uh, you obviously see a connection between dental pathology or, or just anything in, in the oral cavity, breast disease, and this is something that, that we can show. We can because it's pictorial. Um, you know, the disadvantage, I think, with some of the technologies that other uh, people are using is that they are incredible, uh, talented, and as Dr. Yu refers to himself, he's a concert violinist when it comes to playing the EVA machine, right? But try and explain this to a patient. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very difficult, whereas pictorially, and that's one of the reasons I think he's using thermography as well. It's just, here, take a look. Mm -hmm. Pictures are worth a thousand words. One of our other colleagues, Dr. Gary McCallan, is working uh, up in Tennessee, and he's seeing almost a 99% correlation between a toxic root canal and an abnormal thermogram on the same side. So it's just, it it's almost speaks for itself. Right. For all my patients, I review Panorex dental x-ray, thermal imaging, and uh, I also do all this meridian assessment. And they're not all consistent. And because if you don't see, it doesn't mean the problem is not there, especially with the cavity or thermography. One of the most sensitive tests, at least from my experience, has been I know you may not want to like to hear this, but measuring those acupuncture points and the pattern, how they are changing, is one of the, the most consistent and most accurate way to measure those hidden, especially the cavitation. Because usually those are asymptomatic, will not show in the x-ray, even thermal imaging will not show, unless it's a hot spot, the cavitation is a cold spot, it will not show. So, no, I will not rely on thermography to diagnose cavitation, and I will the cavity, the cavity is like a better than the thermal imaging, much better than panorex. But if I have to say the most reliable way, measuring the acupuncture point. And also I do use, I mentioned about the color therapy, it's a color contrast. I see many hidden problems will show up. This is like imaging like a vocal contrast. I see children's museum where there is a silhouette with it like a forest, with all white. But when you, you, don't, you don't know what's in there, it looks like a forest, nothing, like you can see sort of kind of animal be hiding, but when you put a different color in it, you can see those animals are hiding behind, that you can see it. And the, with a the color contrast, you can detect when you combine them with measuring the acupuncture point. So that's my experience. Okay, thank you. Can I? Uh, a, a quick question. Have you done a uh, big cheek retractor, like an ortho retractor, and done a thermal imaging of the dentition? No. Can that be done? Yeah. That would be, because then we can see a cold spot and a hot spot, and we, maybe we can uh, do some more research on that. Yeah, I'm sure as, as technology continues to progress, we'll have intraoral little, tiny little cameras with the same sensitivity that we have now, and we can just go in and, and see the same thing. But we're just not there yet. Can I, can I just jump in and sorry, to ask a quick question about this? When you're doing correlation studies between imaging on the mouth and imaging on the breast, have anybody thought about actually looking at um, um, gene expression array using buccal cells associated or, or, or cells? Because the, the one slide that you had kind of jumped out at me when you looked at the different cells and the number of cells it took when everything got hot. Right. The whole issue with breast cancer is to be able to detect it as early as possible. So if there's a correlation between your imaging and gene expression so that you can see these expressions, then it's theoretically that you could do an actual blood test or a buccal, a buccal a smear of a patient and be able to project earlier on then you probably can and then pick it up with the, with, you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. 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 
Uh, this is for Dr. Yu. Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to ask. So I don't need to ask anymore. So I have another question then. Um, Dr. Yu, I was wondering, how are you choosing the colors to be able to expose these other uh, elements that are in the body? About four years ago, I was at color therapy conference uh, run by optometrists. And they talk about healing effects of the color. And so as, uh, one of the lecture talks about we are deficient in blue because we, we spend too much time in indoor and outdoor have a natural color blue and we're deficient in blue. I did have a photon light. So I started playing with the color, start with the blue, then play with the red, violet, you know, turquoise, all those things. And I would measure the meridian and then I would play with the color after that. And I noticed that I see the pattern. Sometimes I would see things I would never be able to see before. That dental problem show, but I say I put color in and dental was a normal reading and dropped down to 20. Dramatic change. Now, I've been doing this long enough, I've realized that I can play this. I don't have to check, spend 30 minutes to figure out what color to use. You get the same phenomenon using applied kinesiology, muscle test to pick and choose. So you can jump in right away what color you need, how much time you need to unmask me. So yeah, use the same principle, applied kinesiology. And uh, I use photon light in the beginning, I switched to uh, just a color frequency, the German equipment, they can give you color specific frequency at a one million amplification. So I don't have to hold on to it for three minutes or five minutes. I cannot can do it in one minute or three minutes. Give you a totally different color spectrum into the body. And you see things you will never be able to see before. And dental keeps showing up over and over. It's just amazing. I was just showing that to Dr. Cook last night, man. It's there. Problem is there, you know. Dr. you. I have, I have another question. I'm over here. Here. Uh, um, your talk I thought was really brilliant and I'm not at all surprised after knowing you for 15 years that you knew you'd come up with something great and your case reports were really stunning. But I just did have a bit of uncomfort about to be thinking about the doses that you used of the flagell, you know, 500 milligrams TID for three months. I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever taken flagell, but if you read the PDR and flagells carry half to death and then ivermectin on top of that all for a protracted period of time. Um, it makes me nervous just uh, t t treating parasites that aggressively when you don't have some kind of ink on paper to show your, the uh, medical boards if they come after you anyway. Well, how, how do you uh, deal with that? Well, actually, I have to testify in front of the medical board about six years ago about the technique I use. And uh, basically, I say, you know, I did treat 10,000 people. Do you have any experience treating with a uh, parasite medication? And medical board, none of them had any experience. And I was rescued active for the, my, another active duty. And uh, you know, I was teaching at the academic institution as a clinical instructor at Washi Medical School. And they left me alone. But, uh, but the, actually, that case, the patient with the uh, MS, I did ivermectin and metronidazole. He only took met, uh, metronidazole only for one month. I gave him three months because he liked to drink his beer and he cannot tolerate so, you know, he just, but within six weeks after ivermectin and just, you know, one month of a, you know, flash, his brain loose and disappeared. Give some idea. That's what I'm trying to bring it up is that you have a fixation of the dental problem. He's got 14 amalgams and several root canals, and you, in my mind, will be, if I can get the root and all those fillings, maybe MS will go away. But his brain lesion disappeared in six weeks after passing the medication. Now, pick and choose the right kind of medication. I did start with PDR, the standard dose. Low dose, one day, three days, and I realized I need seven days, ten days, two weeks. Realized I need a different combination and different cycle. I have to follow the either full moon cycle or the new moon cycle. You know, it's a ten years of experience, it's a constant evolving. So it's never ending. You know, everybody's a little bit different. There's no protocol. 
although D3 clean, I think I have a protocol, but I don't, you know. It's individual, you know, everybody's respond different. I never prone parasite medication alone. I always use a natural herbal parasite medication, intestinal cleansing, some kind of a homeopathic drainage remedies, kidney support, liver support, you know, all the support. You don't just put them on, otherwise you're gonna have a very strong Alzheimer's reaction. They will get sick. And so you have to train them what to expect. You're going to have a crazy, nausea, lightheaded. Your vision is going to be a little bit funny, but your vision is going to improve once you're done with your parasite medication. I told you briefly mentioned about one woman from Iowa losing eyesight very rapidly documented. They see the parasite in the eye. They try every known medication, including parasite medication. Didn't respond because they're not getting the right medication at the right dose. Only reason I uh, thrown those medica triple parasite medications, I know what to look for, the meridian system, and which one is balancing it out. And within a few weeks, her eyesight came back, and uh, I couldn't even get the medical record from the ophthalmologist. This is a medical school ophthalmology institution, because they will not release the record. They just refused to do it. it w I want to write in my book, but <laughs> I couldn't do it. That is correct. That's the information based on biocybernetics with the acupuncture meridian system. They will give you information about biomechanical problems, biochemical problems, and biophysics at that level. That's information together based on acupuncture meridian system. And it's not that difficult to learn, actually. It's kind of fun. It's, once you learn, it's, you know, practicing dentistry will be more fun. I think that after the reception, we should all go to Dr. Yu's office and start with antiparasitics. <laughs> uh, this is for Dr. Souk. G given fluoride is close to arsenic and toxic toxicity, is your agency looking at fluoride uh, given that we add it intentionally and it's uh, in so many different forms with no dosage regulation? And if you're not studying it, why not? Um, you're talking about um, because you chlorinate water? Mm-hmm. Okay. Fluoridate. Fluoridate. Fluoride. 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 Ah, fluoride. Ah, sorry. Um, I think there have been some <laughs> number of studies that have looked at fluoride and fluorosis. I know that there's been some studies going on in China where there's been high incidences of arsenic associated with fluorosis at the same time. Um, so there are a number of studies that look at fluorosis. Well, the hydro, uh, the form that they're putting in water comes along with arsenic, uh -huh. hydrofluorosilic acid. So maybe something you want to look into. Okay. I don't have any comment on that. I mean, I just, you know, uh, it's not something that we do um, as, a, as an agency. Um, as far as looking at fluorosis or fluoride, we look at fluorosis as a disease associated with arsenic exposure, as I mentioned. But as far as looking at fluoride or fluoride uh, as an agent itself, no, not necessarily. Thank you. It's not our purview, right? I had a question for Dr. Yu as well. Uh, if someone had a sarcoma like the case study you had with the, the left leg case, hmm. if they started radiation, would your uh, treatment be ineffective? Most likely, yeah. Sometimes I would see patients with the chemotherapy and radiation, and the best I can do is protect them from the side effects of the chemo and radiation, for the massive amounts of vitamin C and all other nutritional support. I uh, just had a loss of pancreatic cancer patient. Uh, he was he's going for chemo and radiation, and, and it just, you know, you can override the effects of the toxic effects of the chemo or radiation. The, the patient was very lucky because he could not tolerate the chemo. He had one or two infusions of chemo. They were, his, he had such a severe reaction, so they stopped, sent him home on a hospice care. That's, so he was lucky. And, I, I noticed on your slide that uh, when you were listing the diseases that when you got to Alzheimer's you had a little parenthesis lead and that uh, 
No, uh, Dr. Souk. Oh. Yeah. And I noticed that you had led there, and I was wondering if you had uh, uh, reviewed the recent uh, publications uh, the, by the Mutter uh, Deeth Group that uh, listed, uh, I think, a uh, meta-analysis of uh, an, over a thousand, and they narrowed it down to 259, and they determined that mercury was causal uh, of Alzheimer's disease, and. That's a double part question. Uh, I'll let you answer the first one. All right. Um, I think that, well, there have been some studies that have shown that lead has been associated with Alzheimer's. That's, what, that's why it was positioned on the slide. Um, um, yes, mercury has been associated with Alzheimer's. Um, so has uh, manganese, for, for that matter. Um, I think that, uh, well, I guess the point that, I, one of the points that I was trying to make is that there's all kinds of exposures happening at different points in time, and that it's the, usually the individual's susceptibility and predisposition. So it's quite possible that um, uh, depending on what one is exposed to, can lead to a variety of ailments and diseases, depending on the study, depending on the population, depending on a lot of other factors. That was the point of the slide, one of the points. Does that help? Well, actually, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, the, 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 uh, and, and Boyd showed how lead and mercury were synergistic, so they would even know how, what they want, and he'll discuss the genotype with you, if you like. Um, the other uh, statement I had was that, uh, basically a statement that 90% of the arsenic that is added to the public drinking waters of the United States come from one additive, according to the American Water Works Association. Were you aware of that? No. What's the one additive? Hydrofluosilicic acid. Okay. Um, I think we also have to look at other forms of contamination by arsenic. Okay. Um, there's naturally occurring arsenic from bedrock, and then there's industrial grade arsenic from industrialization. And there is a difference, even though they appear to be different, they, excuse me, they appear to be similar chemically. There is a difference in how they react in people's bodies and, and at the cellular level. Why? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, the other interesting thing about arsenic, and I didn't bring this out, and that is that there have been studies that have shown <clears throat> uh, that we've supported in northern Argentina, northern Chile. And this was out of a group by um, 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 Mar Alan Smith's group at UC Berkeley. And we found that children who had um, um, taken arsenic in, as, in drinking water, at high levels of drinking water, later in life developed um, cardiovascular problems and lung problems that's directly associated with the markers that we see in, in hair and, and fingernail clipping, clippings with regards to arsenic exposure. And my, my point is, is that um, arsenic is ubiquitous. There are all forms of arsenic. Um, and uh, it causes more, uh, depending on when it is given, so to speak, it's going to have an effect on a variety of um, cell and tissue functions. And um, Alan Smith's work was the first time that showed that taking arsenic in and drinking water has an effect on cardiovascular system, specifically lung function as adult, as, as children, as, as, as people get older. And so I think that that's also of interest. Just let me mention that. Well, that makes a follow-up question. Is it what, what form? Uh, you're talking speciation, I, I, I take it. Yeah. And that uh, the the additive that's put in the water is uh, 
basically we buy and put in the water. So that's vastly different than environmental exposure, uh, vastly different than environmental exposure. But what species of arsenic do you find in hydrofluorosic acid and how does that compare to natural arsenic? I can't answer your question. I, don't I know. I don't know. <laughs> but that's certainly a case that's... No, I mean, you know, my, one of the premises that we have to take here, I think, from this panel discussion is that, you know, there's a lot of things that we think we know, and there's some things that we do know, and there's a whole hell of a lot that we don't know, and that's why we're here. Great. Any more comments? Any more questions? Got one over here, Pierre. Dr. Haley, um, the question is, I think you indicated that mercury is excreted largely in, largely in feces. Why do we test urine with uh, DMPS provocation then? It's easy. It's easy. Okay. Now, not over 90% of the mercury, and even in the rat studies that we talked about, way over 90% of the mercury goes out through the fecal route. The Swedes have done the studies over and over. Over 90% goes out fecally. People like the uh, urine because it's easy to collect, easy to stay, assay, and that's the reason they do it. There's no scientific logic behind it at all. And if you just look at the data from the children's amalgam trial, boys don't ex with the same number of amalgam fillings didn't excrete near the mercury that the girls did with that. There are so many things that correlate, I mean, to tell you that urine analysis is, is worthless as a, a measure of exposure or toxicity because people who are not excreting it are the ones that are the most sick. Yes. And they retain the most. So it's accurate, though? Like it, it correlates to... Oh, oh it's, I think the, uh, the uh, mercury challenge test is a good test. I think it, it gives you an indication of your mercury body burden. Yes, I, I have no, no objection to that. Thank you. But, can I comment on that, the DMPS test? That was a John Wilson is an expert with those tests, but anyway, there's a, everybody have a little bit different way of doing DMPS tests. When I did my first training, uh, they do 24-hour urine collections. They delete out so much you cannot see anything. I think most MD stars using six-hour collections. I actually do 90 minutes after the DMPS infusion collect, after 90 minutes after. The half-life of DMPS is about 30 to 40 minutes, so I'm waiting for three cycles to run three, the high peak. When you do that, it's a very reliable test. And uh, I never do a DMPS test alone. I have to prepare my patient, nutritionally support them, and then I will do the test. I would just not, because you can have some strong reaction to the DMPS. I give them homeopathic drainage remedies, kidney support, liver support, so that you will not have the side effects. And we'll see. Even then, the first test doesn't mean it's a final test. It's only the beginning, and it depends on what the test shows. You can put on homeopathic or oral chelating agent, however you want to do it, OSR. Six months later, you recheck again. Typical pattern is high reading, and then you'll go down. But many people also will show very un uh, just very moderate amounts will come out. But as you start support nutritionally from cleansing, detox, and all those things, you see the mercury levels keep climbing up and up and up in two, three, four year periods. So you don't never use one test. You use at least two or three tests in a time interval to see. But you don't just do the NPS or DMS. You have to do the whole nutritional support, drainage together to minimize the stuff the effects and to maximize the effects of what DMPS and DMSA is designed for. More questions? Well, that's it then. Thank you very much, everyone. Very good. Thank you. We have one more announcement from our meetings director, Dr. Janice Topka. The raffle that we're having, it's a free raffle, so you will not have to pay for raffle tickets. And uh, it starts at about 6 o'clock. Hope to all see you in there. And tomorrow morning, we'll start at 8.15. So have a nice time at the welcome reception. Thank the speakers again.